Hey everyone, this is Mark Melvin at GV Yoga Center in Hillhead Island in Bluffton, South Carolina. And today with me, of course, again, is Kara, um, our wonderful posture model. And over the last few weeks, we've heard from quite a few of you requesting more beginner classes. Um, and in response to that, what we've decided to do is put together a virtual beginner's workshop. So if you're relatively new to the practice of yoga, uh, this is going to be perfect for you. And especially if you have never practiced yoga in your life, if you've never been to a yoga studio but are curious and you're interested in how it all works and what we do, this is going to be a perfect hour to 75 minutes for you. So. Over the course of the next little bit, we're going to break this down to about five modules. And as you go through the content, please feel free to pause, rewind. If there's a particular portion that you'd like to focus on, by all means, skip through and uh, skip through and around this workshop to get exactly what you need. Uh, for today, what we're going to do is we're going to start for a few minutes talking a little bit about yoga theory, sort of give you an explanation of what awesome practice is all about, as well as some things that you can expect when you go into a studio to take a yoga class. Uh, from there, we're going to get into the bulk of the work, which is going to be the posture of modules. Uh, we're going to begin with a centering practice. We're going to do a one, two, three deep breathing exercise. We'll move then into warming up and go through various warm-up postures that you're likely to see in the yoga studio. After that, we'll focus on standing postures, which will be the largest module that we have during our time today. And then finally, we'll end with some balanced postures as well as a lot of the postures that we do on the mat when we end a yoga class and before we go into Shavasana. So, with all of that said, uh, I'd first like to offer an initial perspective on what yoga is. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, what is the definition of yoga? And considering yoga is a 5,000 year old practice, uh, those definitions obviously vary from person to person and from tradition to tradition. But one definition that I personally like is that yoga is the integration of head, heart, and hands. And what that means is the integration of mind, represented by the head, our emotions, represented by the heart, and our bodies and actions, represented by the hands. So really, yoga is union. In Sanskrit, that's what yoga means, to yoke or to unite. So really what we're looking to achieve on many of the yogic paths and through many yogic practices is a state of balance in our life not just in our practice, but in everything that we do. Um, interestingly enough, there is no true goal of yoga. Really, whatever the goal is, is going to be personal for you. Each tradition has its own stated goal, but again, it's really up to you and, and your intentions and what you hope to gain from this practice. It is worth noting that what we're going to be doing here in workshopping today, the asana part of yoga, that's the postures, uh, actually represents a very small percentage of what is the overall body of yoga theory. Uh, again, uh, understanding yoga is a 5,000 year old practice. Uh, it began in its earliest stages with uh, practices that were more inward oriented, things like meditation, breath work, uh, witnessing exercises uh, and things that are uh, certainly available um, to you, whether or not whether or not you come to a studio or ever practice asana. These are other techniques and practices that you can certainly incorporate into your day to day life. Um, so, all of this sounds good. Um, so, I guess the real question is for a lot of people: How will yoga asana practice, this physical practice of yoga? Uh, benefit me personally. And what I can say from a physical perspective is that it does promote greater mobility. You're stretching a lot, of course. A lot of people do see this as a great stretching exercise and it certainly can be that. Um, so improved mobility, improved cardiovascular functioning because breath is a huge part of what we do in an asana class. We have this term called vinyasa. And in Sanskrit, that means breath with movement. 
So often we have these vinyasa classes, or you may have heard of flow yoga or flow classes. That's often what's happening, is that we're doing a sequence of movements that promote matching the breath with that movement. So there definitely is a benefit from a cardiovascular perspective. We also do uh, quite a bit of isometric holding in some classes, so improved muscle tone. And then finally, and this is one that some people often overlook, especially when they're new to the practice, is the fact that as you observe your body moving through space, as you're aware of the position that your body is in in a given moment, what you're doing is actually lighting up areas of your brain that reside in the neocortex. And this outer sheath of the brain, or the human brain, is what really controls our executive functioning, our ability to analyze, our ability to use logic, our, our ability to assess, and really our ability to create space between stimulus and our response to that stimulus. So by activating these areas of the brain, we're actually promoting greater self-awareness in everything that we do. So in that respect, yoga and yoga asana practice is incredibly valuable for overall personal development. So with that said, a few things to be aware of when you go into a yoga class or if you're practicing at home. First and foremost, if you come into a studio, particularly if you come into Jiva Studios, we're going to have all the props here for you. <clears throat> now, the two most basic props we often use, aside from your yoga mat, which really any exercise mat is going to be fine, the two most common props that we use are these foamy, uh, spongy, but supportive yoga blocks. Um, there's a lot of substitutes and things that you can use for this. Um, we've used multiple rolls of toilet paper or actual package of toilet paper because everyone has toilet paper right now. Um, other than that, uh, the block and then also a strap. Uh, with the strap, you can use a belt, you can use a piece of fabric, really anything that's going to be comfortable sitting against your body. So there's a strap, the block, and your mat. As you come into the yoga studio, more often than not, studios will have some sort of area outside the actual practice room where we are right now, um, cubbies or something of that nature, so you can put all of your stuff aside, you leave your cell phone, you turned off, of course, in your cubby, and then also leave your shoes and things in there. And we come into this room, folks oftentimes will show up about five to 10 minutes early before class begins, and that's simply so you can sit relax, sort of get used to the space and get uh, quiet and comfortable in the space. Um, in terms of class selection, most studios are going to have a wide range of classes depending on both your goals and your skill level, and Jiva is no different. So if you're a beginner in practice, and this really does kind of represent your first time working on uh, yoga postures, then any class uh, that indicates vinyasa or flow, slow flow, deep stretch would be a great class. Uh, align and flow would be a great class. Relax and restore, also going to be a great class. So really what you can do is start looking at the class descriptions and get a better sense of what's for more of a beginner uh, intermediate level and what's more advanced at Jiva Yoga. Our sort of most advanced class is the Jiva Flow. That tends to be the most energetic. Oftentimes the heat is turned up for that class. Uh, so again, definitely worth uh, checking the descriptions, seeing what's intended for beginners and intermediates, and then building your practice from there. So uh, without any further ado, we are going to get right into, uh, right into our practice. And when you go into a class, Oftentimes, that class is going to be taught according to what's called the arc of the vinyasa class or the arc of a flow class. And what that represents essentially is starting from a place of quiet and stillness, building heat and building energy to sort of a pinnacle moment in the practice. Perhaps that might be the most uh, physically challenging moment of the practice. And then from there, you move down to the mat until ultimately ending uh, on your back in Shavasana. So to start, we start with centering techniques. Most often, that's going to be breath work. So 
I'm going to show you a very simple breathing technique today. This is called one, two, three, deep breathing. And if you have a block or if you have a cushion or a bolster, now would be a good time to perhaps prop yourself up on that so that your hips are elevated a little bit. This is going to help you keep your back straighter. Your spine straighter and is also going to help keep your neck and your head stacked above the spine. So go ahead and come to a comfortable seat. And we are going to take a couple cleansing breaths together. Uh, in a yoga class, you might hear this referred to as a lion's breath. And since no one is watching you and you're not in a studio surrounded by people, you can really get into this one. Uh, some people uh, are embarrassed by it. Um, out in public, and you'll see why. So with the lion's breath, we begin with a deep breath in through the nose. Exhaling with the mouth open. And the tongue out. Let's do that two more times. more breaths here, noticing the pace, the natural pace of your own breath. And now for your next inhalation, begin breathing more deeply and to begin, allow the stomach to expand with that deep breath in through the nose. And as you exhale, allow the stomach to sink back in towards the spine. Right now, only aware of the belly, breathing in through the nose, allowing the belly to expand. Exhaling through the nose and allowing the belly to draw back in towards the spine. And take a couple more breaths there, focusing on the belly. Expand, but with your left hand now, notice as you breathe deeper, the chest will start to expand as well. So we're breathing in through the nose, allowing the belly to expand, observing as the chest rises and expands with the belly, and then as we exhale, observing the chest fall, allowing the belly to sink back in towards the spine. inhalation, allow your belly to expand, notice the chest expanding, and at the end, notice your collarbone lifting. That's your three points. So you're inhaling with the belly for one, chest for two, collarbone for three, and exhaling for three, and two, and one, pushing everything out, inhaling for three, two, one, pausing at the top, and exhaling for three, two, one, pushing everything out. One more time, inhaling for three, two, 
things to heart center here, palms touching. And at this point, if you would like to make an intention for yourself, please feel free to do so. Often, following our centering practice in the studio class, you'll be invited to set an intention. And if you choose to do so, often we'll revisit that intention at the end of class, but it is a very powerful tool to make your practice more meaningful. And those intentions can be your heart's greatest desire. It can be a deep wish for a loved one or a person that you care about in life. And once you have your intention set, feel free to gently, over the course of a breath or two, open your eyes and we're going to start our posture practice. So, as noted, when we come to the studio and we go through an asana class, we're going to go through this arc of a yoga class. So, we started with some centering, we did some one, two, three deep breathing, which is a great practice that you can do independently of your asana practice. It's a great soothing technique. Uh, from there, we go into warm up, and oftentimes we start kind of down on the floor. And today we're going to start in a posture called child's pose. So for child's pose, your toes are going to be connected to the back of the mat, and your knees are going to be out wide on the mat with your hips sitting back onto your heels. And one way to engage more fully down into this posture is to give yourself a little push back with the heels of your hands. That's going to help move the hips back towards your heels. And then you can even, once you've done that, walk the fingers out just a little bit farther. And that's going to help promote a bigger stretch in your side body and under your armpits. So we'll start here in child's pose. If you'd like to show them a closed leg variation, sometimes you'll hear child's pose called with the knees together. And that looks just the same. The only difference being is the knees slide in from the outside of the mat and your hips still slide down towards the heels. So starting in child's pose here, this is a posture that you'll hear called frequently during a class, particularly in a moment of rest. You'll often be given a rest opportunity in child's pose. But today we're gonna move from here into tabletop. So with tabletop, you come up on hands and knees, uh, just as the name suggests. Shoulders lined up over the wrists, hips lined up over the knees, spine lined in a soft neck. So I'm going to put your head down just a little bit, simply so your neck isn't craned up. And this is going to be a great spot for us to work through several postures and demonstrate some of the key movements in asana practice. And the first thing that we're going to run through is called cat-cow. Cat-cow is a very common uh, warm-up posture. It's a great thing to do at home. This is something that I do every morning when I wake up. And it begins, again, thinking about using our breath as we move. It begins with a breath in. And with that breath in, you allow your belly to drop and your gaze to rise. And as you exhale, you reverse that. You tuck your chin and you curl your spine up to the ceiling. So go through this a couple times with the breath in, coming in, and I call this a smile back, making a back smile, and then exhaling, pulling the spine up into your cat back. Now, a very important aspect of this position, you noticed when we went through our breathing exercise that as you exhale, I cue you to empty everything out and to draw your belly back in towards the spine. That movement is gonna create a significant amount of space, and you'll understand what I mean when I say that in a few minutes when we start to move our legs around from this tabletop position. But for cat-cow, again, a foundational warm-up posture, we're mobilizing the spine in two directions, forward and backward. And from there, we are going today to go into a spinal balance and a knee to elbow. So come to some stillness in your tabletop. Again, keeping in mind to keep that neck soft, keep the back soft. And 
we're gonna begin with a spinal balance. This is gonna test your balance a little bit. So with a breath in, go ahead and extend your right arm and your left leg long. And we're gonna pause here for just a moment. So again, this posture is referred to as spinal balance. And here, really notice how it feels on your left hand and your right knee. Notice if you're a little bit wobbly. If so, you may simply need to breathe a little bit more fully. As we're in this posture, we still want to send air down into our belly so that we're supporting the muscles and all the parts around the spine. Good. So let's go ahead back in the tabletop. And let's do the spinal balance on the other side. So extending the left arm and right leg this time. And for this spinal balance, we're going to add a little bit of something extra. So take a deep breath in here, Karen. Let's show that knee to elbow. As you exhale, you'll notice her spine curling up just like the cat back. Go ahead and extend long with the breath in. Exhale, knee to elbow. This time, really draw your spine up, belly button towards the spine. Good. Extend long with the breath in. And exhaling, collapsing here. Inhale, extend long. And go ahead back down to the tabletop. If you'd like to go up on your knees and rest for a second, that would be just fine. So you notice, and this is really quite important, you notice that when she was doing that knee to elbow, particularly when she was exhaling and uh, losing space in the midsection, and what I'm talking about specifically, when we create space, it's most often when we're lengthening our body. So for example, going from a forward fold to standing, we're lengthening our body, and that's the point where we're most likely gonna inhale during the yoga practice. As we're collapsing our body, going from standing to a forward fold, that's most often when we're going to be exhaling. So you notice here, when she was losing space by bringing the elbow and knee together, that's when she was exhaling, and that's also when she was drawing the belly button back towards the spine and creating that round back. That's going to really be helpful, and I'm going to show you why right now. So let's do a low lunge with a twist. So we're going to start on tabletop. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to watch how Kara gets into this position. So let's start with a breath in here. And with your exhalation, step your right foot forward between your hands for a low lunge. Good. So what you may have seen is that when she stepped her foot forward, she curled her back into that cat shape. And if you don't do that, for example, if I try to step forward between my hands without, any, without accommodating any space, it's very difficult for me to get my foot up between my hands, but in creating that space with my back, that becomes much, much simpler. So going through that cat-cow, going through some of these spinal balance exercises is really going to help you understand how to create space in your body so you can more efficiently move through these shapes. So let's go back to tabletop. And let's link up a couple of these movements real quick. So we're going to start, we're going to move from spinal balance into knee to elbow, and we're going to do that on both sides. So with a breath in, extend your right arm and left leg. And with a breath out, bring the knee and elbow together. Good, extend long with the breath in, and collapse with the breath out, curling the spine up. One more time, breath in, extend, collapse, Exhale, good, and let's extend long with the breath in, back in the tabletop with your breath out. Good, and we'll take this other side. With a breath in, left arm, right leg. Exhaling, elbow to knee. Inhaling, lengthening everything out. Exhaling, bringing the elbow to the knee. One more time, inhale. And exhale, knee to elbow. Extend long with the breath in, stretching the leg, stretching the arm. Exhale the table, find stillness here. And now we're gonna move into this low lunge. We're gonna cue a breath in 
And as you exhale, that's when the step will be the step here. Let's go back to the tabletop, and I'm going to cue you. Okay. So let's take a breath in. Exhale, curl the spine with the right foot step in between the hands. And with the breath in, bring your torso upright. Good. So here's where we are for a low lunge. The back knee is down, the front knee is over the ankle, and we're going to move from here into a twist. And we're showing you a lot here in this warm-up because a lot of these warm-up postures really mimic and are analogous to a lot of the standing postures that we do in terms of curling the spine, twisting the spine, and mobilizing it across three planes. So for our twist, we're going to again take a deep breath in here through our nose, and as we exhale, this elbow is going to come to the opposite knee. So opposite elbow to opposite knee in the front. Here we have our left elbow on the right knee. And it's often very nice, particularly in this position, to really press between the hands here. That's going to help to bring that spine. You can see what happens when I press here. That's going to bring that spine further around, and it's going to help you more fully engage in that twist. So really, as much as anything, it is a twist for your lower back, but it's also a twist for the middle of your back. So let's go ahead and reset the tabletop. And we're going to cue the other side. So we're going to go back to tabletop here together. And we'll get prepared. Take a deep breath in through the nose. And as you exhale, curl your spine and step your left foot forward this time. Make any adjustments here that you need to. And with a breath in, bring your torso upright. Good. And we'll meet here with hands at heart center. And again, remembering that we're taking a breath in when our body is extended, and we're losing that breath when the body collapses. So take a breath in here. And as you exhale, begin to twist. This time, the right elbow is going to come to the left knee. And a lot of pressure pressing between those hands to better facilitate that twist. And when I cue her out of this position, I'm going to cue her with a breath in. So, with a breath in, bring your torso back to neutral. And with a breath out, frame your front foot and go back to the tabletop. Good. And that is another phrase that you're going to hear quite often in an asana class is frame your front foot. What that means is place your hands by your front foot. So, with that, we're going to take our first downward dog of the day. Oftentimes, we are moving from the tabletop into downward facing dog or straight from the floor into downward facing dog. And to move there, we're going to curl our toes under, and our hips are going to lift straight up to the ceiling. So you're essentially creating an A shape with your body. Now, something to look out for, particularly with downward facing dog, is a tendency to allow the shoulders to track far out over the arms, and I'll show you exactly what that looks like. So you can see her chest is pressed back towards her knees. She's very flexible, um, so she can do that quite proficiently. But the key thing here is that there's a straight line of energy. There's a straight line up her arms going up to her hips. And what we see a lot, and you can check yourself in the mirror for this, is rather than being back in the A, there's a tendency to scoot out towards more of a plank position. So if you notice that you're in this sort of plank position, or especially if your shoulders are really on fire doing this, then go ahead, and one way to sort of deepen this is to bend your knees, let your torso sink back, and then lift your hips again. It's going to help you get into a better position in your downward facing dog. Another great way to experience this position from a standing, uh, standing posture is against the wall. So if you place your hands on the wall and start to slide your hands down and your legs out, you're going to feel an opening up your side body and in your armpits. 
And that's kind of what you want to experience in downward facing dog. So you might start with your hands here. And simply allow your hands to work down the wall until you start to feel an opening again in your armpits and up your side body. So you ready to move into module two? So from downward facing dog, we're gonna move transition into our second module. This is gonna be our standing postures. So if you're marking positions in this video or you need to pause or rewind and go back to anything, now is gonna be a great time to do it. So with a downward facing dog, we're gonna walk our feet up to the top of the mat and pause here in a forward fold. You can grab opposite elbows here. You can make any movements that you like to make here. If standing with straight legs is a bit much, if that's a bit much sensation, you can make perfect little micro bend in your knees. Uh, that's always available to you anytime you are in these forward folds. But over time, you know, you can start to sort of straighten those knees up. And again, if you have any issues getting into that forward fold, what you might look at is where your belly is positioned. Again, we talk about exhaling and drawing the belly in. That's one way you can deepen this position. Another way you can deepen your forward fold is rather than allowing your body to sort of slump forward into this fold, you can actually hinge, pretend your body is two pieces and hinge at the waist. So to do that, what I'm actually focusing on is pushing my heart out in front of me as far as I can. So pushing the heart out, pushing the heart out. And when it's as far out as it can go, now I know that I'm ready to engage into that forward fold. A lot of times folks tend to just kind of sort of dump over into it, I guess is the best way of, of putting it. And if you start to think about hinging at the waist, that's going to allow your lower back to open up so much more and it's going to create a lot more mobility in your forward fold. So, with a breath in, let's slowly come up to standing. Good. And I'm going to ask you, if you will please, to treat this as the top of your mat. And oftentimes in the flow class and vinyasa class, after we warm up, the first place we go is into sun salutations. You might hear the phrase Surya Namaskar, that is Sanskrit for sun salute. Uh, we start with a sun salutation A, often moving directly into a sun salutation B, both of which we're going to show you. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to very briefly break down the sequence of movements with the breath and then we're gonna put it all together into an actual flow. So, for sun salutation A, Surya Namaskar A, it begins with a breath in and the arms sweeping overhead. From there, there's an exhalation with a forward fold. And stop here. So after this forward fold, you're going to breathe in again into a flat back. So go ahead and show that. And I'm going to ask you to come up just a little bit more. Perfect. So again, with this flat back, it does mean that. It means a flat back. So if you have any issues coming into a flat back with your hands on the floor, by all means, move your legs up a little bit more onto the shins. That is perfectly fine. And the shoulder blades are drawing together and down the back. So inhaling into your flat back, and as you exhale out of flat back, this is where we come into one of the real foundational sequences of our vinyasa practice, and that is the vinyasa transition. So with the breath out, we're going to go from a high plank down to a low plank, using that full time to exhale completely. And I'll ask you to go all the way to the mat. And then after this breath out, we move into a back bend. There are two ways of doing this, both of which we're going to show you. But for Kara, I assume you'll be inhaling into an upward dog. So with upward dog, you see palms are on the mat, arms are locked out, chest, belly are all off the ground. Her hips are primarily off the mat. 
So this is your upward facing dog. If you have any lower back issues, I tend to have a little bit of lower back uh, fussiness from time to time. You can do a posture called baby cobra. And rather than coming all the way up, that's simply a chest lift. So rather than sweeping all the way up in a downward facing dog, you can have this baby back bend. And after we inhale to this baby back bend, we exhale immediately into downward facing dog, which you've seen before. This is our A-frame position. We're drawing the hips up to the sky, pressing the chest and the armpits back towards the knees. We take a deep breath in here, Kara. Exhale and walk your feet forward as you exhale. Stay there in that forward fold, please. So as we transition from downward dog to the top of the mat Sunday, the goal is to arrive in your forward fold with your lungs empty because we immediately inhale to another flat back. We exhale and fold forward again. And then with a big breath in through the nose, we rise all the way to the top, hands meet overhead, and exhale down to mountain or any standing posture that is called. So, sun salutation A, we're gonna go through it very slowly together, and then we're gonna speed it up for a round. So, with a breath in, arms sweep overhead. With a breath out, fold forward. With a breath in, flatten your back. And with a breath out, move from high plank to low plank. This is called chaturanga. And then inhaling into our back bend, exhaling back into downward facing dog. Take a full breath here, in through the nose, out through the nose. One more breath in here now. And as you exhale, start to empty as you begin to move towards the top of the mat, stepping, jumping, or walking. Empty in your fold, inhale to a halfway lift. Exhale and fold forward. Inhale and rise to the top. And exhale to standing. One more time, arms sweep up. Exhale and fold forward. Halfway lift. And exhale, moving through high plank to low plank. I'm doing a variation, moving all the way to the floor. Inhaling through your back bend. Exhaling, downward facing dog. Take a deep breath in here. And with your next exhalation, step or jump or walk to the top of your mat. Go ahead and do that now. Arriving empty, inhaling for a flat back again. Exhale, fold forward. Inhale and rise all the way to the top. And exhale, standing. Very nice. So that was Sun Salutation A, and that really clearly demonstrates this concept of vinyasa, pairing the movement with the breath. Now, when Sun, says, sun, uh, sun Salutation A is called, you're going to hear a variety of names and a variety of phrases thrown around for this transition. You might hear a teacher say, move through your quote-unquote vinyasa transition. What that is, it's that flat back, high to low plank with the back bend, and then into downward facing dog. So that's your vinyasa transition. It might be referred to as you know, your transition sequence or your preferred flow sequence. Don't worry too much about the semantics. Just know that you will move through a lot of positions using that exact sequence of movements. So this is definitely one that's worth uh, revisiting, rewinding, making sure that you're comfortable with that sequence. Um, now moving into Sun Salutation B, Surya Namaskar B. It's uh, much like Sun A, but we start to add another standing posture at the front and another in between. So for Surya Namaskar B, Sun Salutation B, it's gonna begin in chair pose. So take a breath in, move into chair pose. Good. For chair pose, again, you see the single line of energy up her back through her arms. 
the biceps are kind of up close around the ears. Hip is sunk back, knees are together, and she even has her toes off the floor. Her weight is back on her heels, which is a great sort of aspirational uh, goal for this position. But for chair, even if your chair is right here, that is perfectly fine. We are building some heat in the legs. There is a little bit of isometric holding here, so you're getting a bit of muscle work when you get into this position. So as you work with chair over time, you can always work on deepening that chair uh, posture on lowering your hips and bending your knees a little bit more. So go ahead and stand up straight. After that chair posture, things pretty much flow through much like Sun A until we get back into downward facing dog. So let's do that. Let's inhale the chair. Exhale and fold forward. Inhale for your flat back. And exhale, move through high to low. Inhale for your back bend, upward dog or maybe cobra, and exhale back into downward facing dog. Good. So the addition here with Sun B is a posture called Warrior One, and this is really the first true standing posture that we're going to work through today. So oftentimes you'll hear called sweep your leg up with the breath in. I'm going to cue that. So Kara, why don't you sweep your right leg up with the breath in, and with your breath out, step your right foot through between your hands. And let's pause here. I'll ask you to go ahead and put your back knee down. Just relax for a minute. So again, you saw that movement, that bringing the knee up and the foot in between the hands. So when we go through this again, um, what I'm really going to ask you to focus on, what I'm going to ask Kira to focus on, is sort of exaggerating that curl in your back to make sure you can get your right foot up between your hands. Now, for some of us, we may have some trouble, and forgive me if my voice gets lost here, but for some, especially for us guys, if we can't really facilitate this movement here, oftentimes we get stuck right here. And if you find yourself getting stuck here, no big deal. Simply take a step out and take a step back to widen your base. It's nothing to be discouraged about. That mobility comes over time. But more importantly, all our bodies are different. There's nothing that anyone in a studio is doing that's, that's unique to you, that's, that's like you. So allow your body to move the way it moves. Don't worry about what anyone else is doing in the studio. Don't worry about how anyone else's posture looks or um, you know how they're moving. This is really all about you and your body. So let's start this from the beginning. And we'll go through this front part rather quickly. So again, rather than arm sweeping up, we're sweeping the chair. So breath in for chair. Exhale and fold. Halfway lift with your breath in. And then move through your transition. Exhaling from high to low. Upward facing dog or cobra with your breath in. Back to downward facing dog. So with the breath in, allow your right foot just to raise a little bit off the ground. And as you exhale, begin to move your shoulders out over your wrists, curling the spine, bringing the knee up, and then allowing that right foot to step down. Very good. For warrior one, the back heel is going to drop to the ground. And with the breath in, bring your torso upright. The arms will sweep overhead. So you see her from the side there, from the front. It's going to look like this. And here, you can also start to notice and begin to play with areas of tension in your body. So, Kara, as you have your arms up there, and for those of you at home, notice if you have a lot of tension in your shoulders. The arms are overhead, but the shoulders are relaxed. So let your shoulders relax. Notice if you're carrying tension in your jaw or your face. Allow your face to relax. Where we want energy right now is in the legs and especially on this back leg because it's that back leg sort of energetically pushing into the mat and you can even push this back blade of your foot down into your mat and that's going to support the weight that you're holding on the front leg there. So 
Let's take one more breath in, and as you exhale, here, frame your front foot, show them what that looks like, and move back through your vinyasa transition. So as we go from side to side, we're using the same sequence of movements, going from that high plank to the low plank, engaging our back then, and then coming back into downward facing dog. So with the left foot this time, with the breath in, just barely raise your left foot. And as you breathe out, shoulders over wrists, spine curls, then the left foot gets up between the hands, right heel drops, and we rise toward the one with the breath in. Again, we're expanding our body, so that's when we're gonna feel over there. <clears throat> Take one more breath in here. And as you exhale, frame your foot. And let's go ahead, rather than going through this whole flow, let's meet at the top of the mat. So go ahead and pause where you are. We're gonna meet at the top of the mat together, kind of standing. And we're gonna run through this sequence once all the way through uh, rather quickly. So, inhale into chair. Exhale, forward fold. Halfway lift with the breath in. And fold forward, moving through the door transition, high to low. Breathing out, going all the way to the mat if you want to. Inhaling into your back bend. Exhaling into downward facing dog. And with a breath in, raise the right leg. Exhale to step through. Inhale to rise to warrior one. Arms sweep overhead. Good. Let's stay here for one full breath. Plus one breath in. And as you exhale this time, or by framing your front foot, you're going to step the right foot back to plank and use that out breath to go all the way down to the floor. Inhaling into your back bend, exhaling back into downward facing dog, breath and movement. Inhaling the left foot high, exhaling to step through, and inhaling to rise into a warrior one. Good. Pausing again for a breath. One more breath in, and as you exhale, frame your foot again, step back to plank, and you can stop right there. Rather than going, uh, you can, you don't have to stay in plank. Um, rather than going through that again, we're gonna go on to a couple other standing postures, but you see that vinyasa transition, moving from high plank to low plank or your belly, whichever is more comfortable, moving into the back bend and into downward facing dog, is really how we move through a lot of our postures here. So with that in mind, what we're gonna do is actually show you several more standing postures that you're likely to hear. We're gonna take out the flow and we're gonna let you see what these postures look like. And we're gonna start with crescent pose. And what we'll do is sort of take these from downward facing dog. So Kara, if you wanna move from downward dog, uh, face either direction your preference. And again, thinking about this left, this leg up and stepping through, we do that for a lot of these starting standing postures, which are most often going to be like a warrior one or this crescent pose. So go ahead, take a breath in, raise your right leg, exhale and step through. And before you come up, I want to point something out. The difference between crescent pose and our warrior postures is that her heel is not touching the mat. So there is some balance involved in this posture. So as you come into this lunge shape here, before you use your in-breath to bring your body upright, make sure that you feel some stability here. So when you're ready with the breath in, bring your torso upright. Good, and for this, it's very important to keep this back heel driving to the wall behind you. Again, much like Warrior One, this back leg and the power and energy that you put in this back leg are going to support this front leg. So crescent, our knee is over our ankle, our back leg is extended long, the heel driving back, and again, arms up, but shoulders relaxed, soft shoulders, soft neck, soft face. Okay? And from the front, this is what you're going to see. So let's go ahead, uh, shake out your right leg, 
and give yourself a little bit of a break. And we'll do this with the left side now. So again, we do everything both sides. So coming back into your nice A-frame, downward facing dog, take a breath in and lift your left leg a little or a lot, it's up to you. Exhale and step your left foot forward. Back heel stays up and with a breath in, bring your torso upright. Good. And this is crescent. From here, let's go to warrior two. So back into uh, downward facing dog. In warrior two, much like warrior one, the front leg, knee is over the ankle, the back uh, heel is down on the floor, and we're gonna show you the difference. So with a breath in, allow your right leg to come off the mat a little bit. Exhale and step through. Back heel drops, so now you are just like warrior one, and the difference comes in when you rise. Rather than rising straight up, you'll cartwheel, good, so that your back is essentially in line with a wall or a different surface. So with Warrior One, you can see I'm going to be here. And with Warrior Two, we open this way. A nice practice for this posture is to leave your gaze right here on the tip of your finger. That can be very relaxing. Or if you would like to open your shoulders a little bit, you can rotate your palms up towards the ceiling. That's going to help open shoulders, open chest. And from this position, we often call what's uh, referred to as reverse warrior. And to reverse your warrior, this is going to be done, again, we're taking away space in our body, so we're going to use a breath out. So take a breath in here, and as you exhale, that front arm is going to sweep up towards the ears, towards the eyes, and this left arm can either slide down the leg, or if you don't like that sensation, uh, you can always kind of draw your form up to your low back. That also feels nice for the shoulders. You take a breath in here, and as you exhale, go back into warrior two. Good. Now let's move this to the other side. We're gonna show you one other variation out of warrior two. So let's go back to downward facing dog. And this time we're going to use our left foot. So with a breath in, a little lift in the left leg, exhale, step through, curling the back, making space. And with that breath in, cartwheel your arms up so your chest is facing your screen if your mat's wide. If your mat's long, you're going to be facing one of the walls on either side of you. And take a breath in here. And let's do that reverse again. So as you exhale, allow this left arm to sweep up, the right arm to sink back. You should feel a big opening in your side body here. And from here, we might go to a position that's called extended side angle pose. And for extended side angle pose, that front elbow is going to go down and meet the front knee in the right arm or back arm, whichever side you're oriented on, is gonna sweep up. And again, you can see, we talk about these lines of energy. This is a long from the foot all the way up to the tip of our fingers. This is one long line and one long stretch. So it's nice with your shoulder blades here, or your shoulder side rather, to make sure that that's comfortable, that that's in alignment. Oftentimes, people will kinda sort of let their shoulders sort of flail about um, and really having this shoulder socket nice and aligned with the arm straight up over the head is gonna be the safest position for your shoulder. Good, and let's come back up into warrior two. So here we have warrior two, reverse warrior, and extended side angle. Very good. So let's uh, all come up to standing. You are uh, going to meet again at the top of our mat. I'm going to show you a couple more postures, a couple very common standing postures. I want to start with pyramid. 
The pyramid is quite nice. It's a beautiful hamstring stretch. And unlike the other standing postures, which often involve a very wide base, for pyramid, it's going to be about two thirds to a half of your normal base. So why don't you step your right foot back? Good. And for this, you can see from the front, my feet are separated here. Uh, the toes are pointing straight to the front of the mat. And as we move into this posture, what I'd like you to do is again, take a deep breath in here at the top. And just like our forward folds, exhale as you go down and hinge at the hips, pushing that heart forward before you ultimately allow yourself to surrender down into that fold. Now, this is a great place to introduce props because this is such a, a sensation heavy position to be in. We have these blocks and you can support yourself up on these blocks to take a little bit of that sensation out of the leg and slowly over time allow your body to sink deeper and deeper into these postures. And with a breath in, very slowly bring your torso upright. Cool. And we're going to do the other side for that. We're going to do each side both ways. So this time, left foot is going to be back again. They're railroad track a little bit, so there may be six, maybe inches, maybe more of separation between the feet. Toes forward. Take a deep breath in here. This time, put your hands on your hips. Have your fingers here. And fold forward with your fingers here and feel your body hinging at your waist. Allow yourself to fold over that straight front leg. Once you enjoy this for a couple breaths. Good. With your next breath in, slowly bring your body upright. You come to a comfortable standing position. So, with this particular standing uh, module, we've done a lot, but a lot of what we've done is also very foundational to studio practice. We went through Sun Salutation A, Sun Salutation B, which includes Chair and Warrior One. We showed you Crescent. We showed you, uh, what else did we show them? Pyramid. Okay. And we showed you Warrior Two with Reverse Warrior and an Extended Side Angle Pose. So that those standing postures are really gonna cover a lot of ground for you if and when you go to your first studio class or when you take more of our online classes on YouTube. Um, but keep coming back to these, keep looking at the alignment, keep looking at the various energy cues and sort of the sensational cues where you should be feeling these postures. And that covers what will be about half or so of a typical yoga class. From our standing work, we go into balanced postures, and today we're going to show you tree. And when we work on balancing, what I often like to cue, or what I like to, to you know, sort of lay out into the studio, is for people to really notice their feet. Not so much worry about the way your body looks, but to know what it feels like to feel stable on one foot. And you can do that by simply lifting one foot a couple inches off the ground. You don't need to go any farther than that. But just standing here, looking at the camera with my right foot off the ground, I feel all the work my left leg is doing. I feel all the points on my left foot that are connected to the ground. So really for balanced postures, ideally this is the type of awareness you want to bring to your body to feel and experience stability and then start to move your body within that feeling of stability. So let's go ahead and start with our right foot. And for tree, one way to start into tree is to make yourself a little kickstand with your right foot here. We notice stability in our left foot here. We feel comfortable if you're ready to move. You can slide the sole of your right foot, perhaps inside your calf now. And this may be as far as you go today. 
and that's perfectly fine. There are days when I can't get much farther than this because my balance, for whatever reason, is not functional that day. But if you're ready to go a little further and take this to a full expression of tree, the right foot, the sole of the right foot, is going to come up between the thigh, or you might also, and I'll do this, if I can do it without falling over, I'll, I'll let you do that then. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, sole of the right foot inside the left leg, or if she has uh, her right foot sort of cradled in her left hand there. And from here, if you find stability here, you can start to grow your tree, expand your arms long, If you fall out, you see we do it. If you fall out, don't worry about it. Relax, establish stability, come back into it. And once you start to really feel stable in this posture, this is where you can start playing with your gaze. It's easiest with these balanced postures to begin with your gaze down on the floor and keep it in one spot. That's gonna really help you out with your balance and also remember to keep breathing. So. Let's go ahead and set the tree up on the right foot this time. <clears throat> so getting established on the right foot here. And again, feeling stability, you know, feeling balance. Feel, seeing what it feels like on your right foot to have to balance. Each side is different. For me personally, I'm much more balanced on my left foot than I am on my right. So there's definitely a different sensation there. And once you find stability here, you can start moving through this progression or you can go ahead and start taking tree uh, to its fullest expression, uh, if that's where you are right now. So for me, I'm gonna start here. I feel good here, so I'm gonna move the sole of my left foot into my calf. I feel good here. I'm gonna move my leg up inside my thigh. And once I feel the stability here, I'm gonna allow my arms to extend towards the ceiling, and then perhaps, start playing with my gaze a little bit here. So this is tree. This is a beautiful, wonderful posture. It's a very popular balanced posture, one that you will definitely see a lot. And it's one that is very empowering because, um, you know, it's, it's one that's very accessible. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities to experience this balance, regardless of how mobile you are. This is a wonderful, wonderful balanced posture. So from here, after balance, we're going to go down to the floor. And to go down to the floor, what we're going to do today <clears throat> is go into a yogi squat called Malasana. This isn't any really different than any other squat that you might otherwise perform. Um, but I will ask you to hand me a block and I'll let you show them the modification for this. So with the yogi squat, toes are more or less going to be pointed straight forward, a little bit wider than hip distance apart. And then with the torso sort of remaining upright, we're going to engage your core here. We start to sit back and let our hips sink down between our knees. And you see Kara there, she has a block, and I'm actually going to take my block and put it on its high setting. This is a perfectly acceptable prop and a variation for Malasana. If your current mobility level won't allow you down here, no problem. The big thing here with Malasana is that we're going to start feeling some opening in our hips, in our groin, and eventually that depth and that mobility will come the more you do this. It's like anything, the more you work at it, the more growth uh, and the more progress you're going to experience. So with Malasana, we're going to go down to the mat. Now, at the end of your vinyasa class, you're typically, typically going to spend anywhere from you know 15 or 20 up to 30 minutes and in some cases entire classes revolve around being on the mat but this is the time in class where lights are going to start going down and we're going to start coming on the downhill slope of that arc we're going to lower our energy level we're going to take out the flow and we're going to start getting into some real deep stretch work so what we want to show you is a couple postures that uh, really sort of represent the array of postures that you're going to move through. 
um, with our mat postures, often we're going to do at least one back bend. We're going to do some form of hip opener. We will have four folds and twists, and we're also going to have inversions and restorative postures. So there's really six or seven areas of the body that we're going to work through here. And I'm going to pick one posture from each setting to show you. And what I encourage you to do is if and when you go to a studio class, be sure and tell the teacher that you're relatively new and make sure that that individual is queuing for your experience level. We should honestly be doing that anyway, um, just assuming that uh, people will value the cues that we provide, but do not be afraid to ask for cueing. Do not be afraid to ask for cueing for a beginner um, because we've all uh, done that, we've all been there. So the first posture that I wanna show you is going to be a back bend um, that's often where we go first and for our back bend today we're going to show you bridge so for bridge let's go onto the back and i'm going to give you actually another variation of a back bend if you have lower back issues or if you're experiencing some back pain so for bridge what we do sole of the feet soles of the feet are going to be on the mat knees bent heels back towards the sits bones. You can see she can almost touch her heels there with her fingers. And as you go into this back bend, it's literally as simple as lifting your hips up off the mat as high as you can. Now, if you engage your glutes, squeeze your butt a little bit, you saw there was a little bit of a lift there. So you're definitely engaging your core, engaging your core here supports the muscles of the lower back. You're using your glutes here also to support the muscles of the lower back. And go ahead and lower down here. One option, prop option for this back bend is the block, as you can see. So if you will, go ahead and get into your bridge. And different levels, you can see, depending on where you are. I'm going to go ahead and put this on the second lowest level here. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's important to remember that when you put anything on your back, be careful of your spine. With back bends, you have this hard place down here at your lower back where your pelvis is and where that rises. I typically am going to use my pelvis up on that support rather than trying to place all the support directly on my spine. So do be cognizant of that. And I'll ask you to move that block and go ahead and lower all the way down. So let's do this one more time. We're going to show you the full bridge, and then I'm going to show you an optional restorative back bend. So go ahead and go up into your bridge. And this time what I'd like you to do is to start working your shoulder blades up underneath your back. You can see what she did there. She kind of rotated her shoulder blades back to give herself a little bit more height. Her arms were coming together underneath her back and binding there. So this is really going to be your fullest expression of bridge. You can go ahead and lower here. And if you have lower back pain or are dealing with any lower back issues, do not necessarily worry about going into something that energetic very quickly. Uh, there's a wonderful posture, one that I love, called pontoon. That's what we use in yin or in vinyasa. We call this pinnacle. So for pinnacle, why don't you stretch your legs all the way out and stretch your arms all the way out. And we're gonna use this prop, again, underneath the pelvis, getting some support there. I'll let her put it where it's good for her. And this is going to be a wonderful, gentle, and restorative back bend. If you don't have a yoga block, and in fact, in, uh, in, in replacement of a yoga block, you might have a blanket in your home that you can roll up, you might have a bolster or a stack of pillows, but make this position comfortable for you because if you're lying here for two to three minutes in this back bend and there's something digging into your back, I promise you it's not gonna be a pleasant experience for you. So be sure that you have something comfortable underneath your back to support your weight. And if you have any issues with your lower back, this is gonna be a great alternative back bend for you. So, um, Kara, if you will, I'm going to ask you to put the soles of your feet on the mat 
and then give your hips a little lift, and then remove your prop that way. That's a nice, safe way to remove your props to sort of lift back into that bridge position rather than just trying to rest them and come under your back. So, those are our two back bends, bridge and pinnacle. And now I'd like to show you one of our most popular hip openers, and this is called pigeon. So, we're gonna get into this two different ways. Kara is going to move into this position from downward facing dog, and I'm going to move into this position from standing at the top of the mat so you can see what we're both doing. So, as with the other standing postures, if we were moving to pigeon from uh, downward facing dog, we might initiate that with the leg up. So, why don't you go ahead and right leg up? And from here, the right leg is going to come forward, but rather than stepping the foot in between the hands, the right knee is going to lay on the right side of the mat and the right ankle is going to come over to the left side of the mat. So you can watch me do this from standing. If I stand here with my right leg crossed over my left, uh, this is a, a nod to one of our teachers, Connie Cappy, she uh, developed this uh, position in, which I really love. From here, we're going to bend forward, allow our hands to find the ground, and then simply step our left foot back and allow our right leg to come down here. So here you can see my, my uh, calf isn't completely parallel with the top of my mat. That's not a big deal. Again, remembering that everyone's body is shaped differently, this is gonna look much different. You see her shin is almost parallel with the top of her mat. For me, when I sink down into pigeon, I'm actually closer to about 45 degrees here. So, um, you know, again, I don't, I'm not worried about that. Um, I get just as much of a hip opener there um, as she does, maybe even more because I'm not quite as mobile as she is. So don't worry too much about that. The key here is that you get some sensation of hip opening here. And then also on this left side, you'll notice that her hips are pretty level. If you notice at any point that one of your hips is coming way up or sinking way down, you know, again, you can use these blocks and you can use mats and blankets and things like that to give yourself a little bit of extra support. So for me, if my back hip up was up right here, I might give myself a little something to lean into for my right hip. So let's go ahead and take that from the left side. <clears throat> Make sure that we get both. And again, if you're following with me, this is going to be a forward fold. Get some support from our hands. Step the right foot back and let the left leg lie across. And then I'm going to gently lay my torso down over my front leg. Pillows, blankets, you might have in front of you here. Some classes. You might spend three to four minutes in this posture in those classes. Most often you are going to have pillows or bolsters or something comfortable. So this is Pigeon, one of our foundational, one of our most popular hip openers. And Kara, we're going to show them how to get out of Pigeon. And we're going to do this very slowly. I'm going to cue you through. So to come out of Pigeon, I'd like you to curl your back toes under. And I'd like you to lift your back knee off the mat. And very slowly, with the assistance of your hands, start to bring your torso upright. And now, pushing down through your hands, allow this leg to straighten out behind you. Perfect. And allow yourself to lower all the way down to the mat. Good. So, very important, especially when we get into these deep stretches, that you're not rushing to get out of the pose. You've cut off a lot of circulation to certain parts of your body. So moving slowly out of those postures really helps that rebound of blood flow, feel more natural, it makes it more smooth. You're gonna get a, you know, just a, 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 just a more even, I guess, release when you move slowly out of these postures. So from here, what I'd like to do, we've done a couple back bends, we've done a hip opener. I wanna show you a twist and a forward fold. And then we will go down uh, for our inversion. So we're going to do our forward fold first. And for our forward folds, we're going to do head to knee pose. 
And this really is much like a forward fold if we were standing straight up. The only difference, the main difference, is that we're sitting on the ground, of course. So for our head to knee, another great place to introduce this prop. This is our strap. You might have a belt, really anything that you can put around your foot that can help you deepen into this stretch is going to be good here. So recall when we moved into some of these folding postures, we cue you to push your heart forward and hinge. And this is another one of those places where you can do that. So for this posture, you're always, again, begin with a big breath in, lengthening everything long, and then with your breath out, pushing your heart forward, pushing your heart forward, and then eventually landing over that straight front leg. And if you're using a strap here, it's not going to be any different. You'll still lengthen, heart forward, and then you might simply walk your hands up that strap to deepen the stretch. What we want to avoid here is dumping into this fold. So again, I showed you the heart going forward. If I don't push my heart forward and focus on hinging and instead collapse my body forward, this is what my personal fold looks like. And there's not much there uh, for me. There's certainly not much there in the leg. So pushing the heart forward, hinging the hips, and let's switch legs here. Good, take a deep breath in, extend everything long, and as you exhale, push your heart forward, and now collapse over that straight leg. postures here. First, we're going to do a posture called recline, recline cobbler's pose, Supta Baddha Konasana. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as. It's a Sanskrit term. Uh, so for Supta Baddha Konasana, go ahead and bend your knees up. Allow the soles of your feet to find the floor. And now let your knees fall down to the sides so that the soles of your feet come together. It's a very relaxing very restorative posture. And if you'd like to pause it here and stay here for a couple of minutes, do feel free. We are going to move along. So to come out of this reclined cobblers, I'd like you to bend, take both knees up to the middle. What we're going to do now is go into cradle. That essentially involves hugging both of your knees into your chest. So go ahead and come into cradle. And from cradle, we're going to go into our supine twist. So what I'm going to ask you to do, Kara, is maintain your right knee and let your left leg go long. And then allow your right knee to fall over the left side of your body. Good. And the key point here is to make sure that you maintain contact with both shoulders. So you can see she's uh, brought her right knee over. And again, a great opportunity for this prop. If you'd like to have that prop under your knee, what that often allows people to do is if they feel that little bit of support underneath their body, it's going to allow their body to relax into it more. If we have space here dangling under, uh, <clears throat> underneath the body part, oftentimes there's sort of a hesitancy, hesitancy to just surrender into that space because there's nothing below us. So having that little bit of structure below you can promote further relaxation. And it's something that I definitely encourage you to experiment with. And let's go ahead and cradle our knees back in again. This time we're going to keep hold of our left knee and allow the right leg to go long. And I'm going to show you what this looks like from the front. So we're cradling here. Right leg extends long. And the left knee goes over the body. And again, you can see my left shoulder is still on the ground. So 
if you find yourself coming to a point where your shoulder is lifting off the ground, then go ahead and stop there um, if you want. If you want to go on, go on over, that's fine. But, you know, again, for the hips and for the sciatic, it's best if we can leave that back flat and just let the hips and the twist do the work for us. So go ahead and roll all the way flat on your back. And often when we end a vinyasa class or a flow style class, we end with an inversion. So for today, what I'm going to show you is waterfall or legs up wall. And I'm going to actually ask Kara <coughs> to do legs up wall. And before you go there, yeah, I'm going to cue that. So to go into legs up wall, what you can do is actually sit sideways beside the wall and stack one of your hips there. And then start to allow your back to find the ground while you rotate your legs around. Good. And that's a nice way to get into that posture. Another alternative for this, this being legs up wall. For waterfall, we might have a prop, again, under our low back. That is to say, supported in some way by the pelvis and legs. Straight up in the air. This is, like a lot of these postures, this is one that is really incredibly restorative and incredibly relaxing to do independent of a yoga class. This is something that's simply nice to do in your living room uh, to give your blood just a different way to work through your body. So we'll often spend a couple minutes, uh, maybe longer, in some sort of inversion until you start to pick up and develop some more complex inversions ranging from you know shoulder stand to headstand or handstand. Um, this is always going to be available for you. And I do want to point out, we go through these modifications for a very important reason, and that's simply to empower you to move with your body in a way that your body not only wants to move, but in a way that feels good for your body. Not all of these postures, the way that they're cued, necessarily feel good for every individual. So it's really important that you're listening to your body that you're moving your body in a way that feels good for you. You want sensation. You definitely want to sort of come up to that edge of sensation and experience what that feels like, but without being violent to your body, without doing damage to your body. We really do want to be kind and gentle with our physical bodies um, as we move through these postures. And that really is, if, if there's one piece of advice or one piece of guidance or coaching that I can give you, it's to relax, move slow, and don't push too hard, too fast. So we end our classes in a posture called Shavasana. And this is corpse pose. And for corpse pose, it uh, just, as the name suggests, involves like that laying on your mat. So, at the end of class, as your teacher moves you into Shavasana, this really is your time to relax, to find some stillness, to find some silence, to essentially turn off everything that had happened before during the day, to not dwell on what you have happening the rest of the day, but simply to treat yourself to some silence and to some stillness. There are so few places uh, really that we can that we can access that um, just in our day-to-day -day lives between work and parenting and uh, community obligations and everything else. So if you're in this class and if you have these five to 10 minutes in Shavasana with the lights down and a nice cool lavender towel, do please enjoy that time, relax into it. And at the end of Shavasana, when the class is brought back together, and we're going to go ahead and end with you this way as well, everyone will be asked to come back into a comfortable seat. 
We'll bring our hands together at heart center. And at the beginning of our time here with this workshop, if you chose to set an intention for yourself, what I'd like you to do is revisit that intention. I'd like you to repeat that intention to yourself. And I'd like you to confirm for yourself that that is your intention. And after we've reestablished that intention, we'll bring our hands up to third eye center. The light in me recognizes and honors the light in each of you. At the end of class, we bow to ourselves and to one another and we say the word Namaste. If you have any questions about what we've done, please reach out to GB Yoga Centers. Again, you can go back through any of these modules. We have centering, warm up, standing, and then moving down to the mat, as well as our yoga theory discussion at the beginning. Please do reach out with questions or comments. Click subscribe down at the bottom of the screen, and we look forward to seeing you in the studio soon. Take care. I'm going to turn this thing off.